Okay, so um, so verse 13, we see that Paul talking about the word of God, which uh, works effectively in us who believe. So that's one of the keys to to have the word of God effectively working in us. You know, if we we know that the word of God is, um, we know that the word of God is powerful. We know that the word of God is uh, alive. We know that the word of God is a truth. Um, we know that the word of God carries the power of God, etc. But how do we you know, experience the the power of the word of God, right? So this is the key that it effectively works in us who believe. So it's linked to our faith, right? When we believe in the word of God, we can expect to experience the the power of the truth of the word of God. Okay. So um, and then towards the end of that chapter, um, is talks about. Uh, you know the kind of persecution that uh, um, this church was going through um, you know a lot of persecution affliction and uh, he says you know you became imitators of the churches of god which are in judea in christ jesus that is verse 14 chapter chapter 2 verse 14 for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. Okay, so um, so this is what uh, you did. You know, you you know, um, became imitators. How they the other churches were facing persecutions, you also faced the persecutions. Um, and you you know, uh, so like we read earlier, it says their faith, their hope, their patience, and everything. Uh, was something uh, the faith in God and um, the life they lived was something that was uh, you know the whole region came to know it was a testimony which everyone came to know right okay um, let's go to chapter three okay let me share the notes also okay. So, chapter 3 says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. Okay, so what is it that they could no longer endure? Right? See, this is something that they wanted to know how the believers in Thessalonic, Thessalonica were doing. Right, so it's not like they could no longer endure the persecution. That uh, it's it's something that they wanted to they wanted to know, um, you know what was the uh, you know, what was the believers doing and how were they facing um, and uh, and all that. They, so they wanted to know that, right? So they they sent word. What did they do? You know, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So Paul was obviously concerned about the faith of the, these new believers, right? So he's in Athens. Now the, the believers are there and um, in Thessalonica, the church is just new, but they've all come. There's a we read about the Jews, we read about the multitude of the Gentiles, um, some devout uh, Greeks, and also some of the leading women. They came to know the they know Christ through the gospel. And, and now, you know, he's sending Timothy, and this is how he refers to Timothy, brother, minister of God, fellow laborer. Right? Timothy has been there through the first missionary journey and also the second missionary journey. And, and uh, so... He has obviously grown and, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the second missionary journey, right? So he has grown, obviously, and uh, he says, our laborer, our brother and minister of God and our fellow, fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, okay? Um that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, but you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. That's worth three. So no one should be shaken by these afflictions. You know, the thing is, now he's going to say uh, uh, later, you know, in, the, in verses four and five, he, he talks about how the tempter, how Satan is also instrumental in bringing these persecutions, okay? in stirring up people, to, to act against the believers. 
right to 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 oppose the message of the gospel right because he is the tempter he is the destroyer he he is steal kill and destroy right so he does that so um so he says here that you should not be shaken and the word used there shaken means uh, to be um to be you know drawn away from the faith right to be seduced to uh, to be drawn away uh, from whatever they were doing right so it says uh, that you should not be shaken right so that you so that you would not be uh, you should uh, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions shaken by these so these even these afflictions even these difficulties that they were facing were capable of drawing them away from the gospel right? because people could all always say it's too difficult what is the point and it's too difficult for us to continue so no one should be shaken for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this and paul says right that uh, all those who want to live a godly life in christ will suffer perse- persecution right so he tells timothy so um so the thing is that uh, saying no one should be we are appointed for this well, that's that's uh, um it is very clear is not you know holding back from speaking the truth so you know just like you know this is the truth that we are appointed for this okay and and the word appointed uh it means that um, you know we are uh, we are set like it it actually has a, a picture of a city that is situated on a hill right it we are sit in set in place we are uh, we are put in place uh, like that so we are set by god we are uh, laid down you know, these things are put put together put down set for this so we are so paul is saying that you know you know that we are appointed for this to go through these kind of afflictions okay um so it's um saying no one should be sh- shaken for in fact we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know so you know um so he, in addition to you know the gospel being um, the good news and how you are you know saved and what was what happened on the cross and uh, and the fact that we are redeemed you know while all that is you know the great news the greatest news of all good news um and the word coming with you know not just in word but also in power all while all that is truth uh, the truth the response from the people the response from the community right while sometimes it is extreme there is persecution there is, there are afflictions and typically for the church in Thessalonica they faced tribulation so uh, paul in fact says we told you before when we were with you that you would suffer tribulation so he warned them saying for the sake of the gospel there would be tribulation but you, but you need to be strong you know you need to stand strong so he has actually prepared them for this persecution and tribulation verse 5 for this reason when i could no longer endure it i sent to know your faith you know this is the second time he's saying you know verse 1 also says when we could no longer endure it and again in verse 5 when i could no longer endure it i sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain you know he has spent about 3 weeks or and more uh three weeks definitely in the synagogues and then synagogue in uh, Thessalonica and outside and then teaching in house of Jason um so saying you know lest i uh, i uh, you know by some way satan had tempted you away from the faith so i wanted to know your faith so that's wherefore i'm sending therefore that is why i sent uh Timothy to know how you were doing okay and also verse 2 he says to establish you to encourage you concerning your faith you know that's the reason timothy was sent okay um verse 6 but now tim now, now now that timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you therefore brethren in all our affliction and distress we were comforted concerning you by your faith 
For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Okay, so he's saying that. Uh, so Timothy's come back. He's come with good news, and and therefore. He's saying that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also, you know, mutually, we also feel the same way. We want to see you. Uh, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we are comforted. You know, when we heard this great news, the church was doing great, the believers are doing great, the believers are standing strong in all this affliction. You know, that comforted us so much that despite all the persecution and affliction that we were facing, we were comforted. Okay, and uh, now we live. If you stand fast in the Lord, now, so he's, in other words, he's saying you stand fast in the Lord, and that will greatly encourage us and strengthen us, and for that we can continue what we are doing. Okay, and what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? So, uh, this is Paul and his teams. There, you know how they rejoice for the for the believers and saying you know he says night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your face so they've been praying for these believers for this church um and they've been praying uh, you know without ceasing so night and day you know they've been remembering them in prayers and um, praying earnestly right he says uh, praying earnestly praying exceedingly sorry and um, and uh, he says that uh, that we might see you and also perfect that uh, perfect what is lacking in your faith. Okay, so he says uh, exceedingly, which is you know like over and above like what we can. You know that's that's how we are doing, praying exceedingly uh, that we might see you, see your face, meaning we might be in your presence, and that we might perfect. Okay, and that word there is um, to mend something, right? something that is broken to bring back, so that it's it's repaired. Right? To to it also means to complete something. Okay, to to complete something, to mend, repair something. So he's saying what is lacking in your faith. Okay, something that is uh, you know they are, they are of course obviously they are growing and what is lacking meaning what is deficient. Okay, what is not there or what is there in a smaller measure okay so um, whatever is lacking in in your faith in the faith that you have you know, obviously it is it is a faith that that is being spoken of etc but there's always room for growing and for what is not there till now or what is missing uh, or, or we should not say missing but what is actually not there what is there in a smaller measure that, that that it can always grow, right? So he's saying that uh, we wanted to perfect that, we wanted to complete that uh, through the ministry. Right? So uh, what is lacking in the faith? Okay. Now, uh, verse eleven. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. To one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Okay, so, um, so he's saying, you know, this is what we want to do in ministry. Do we want to come and perfect uh, what is lacking? Now, now may our God lead you. May He direct. May He uh, you know, lead us. Uh, may the Lord direct our way to you. You know, in His plan, in His timing, in His purpose. May He take us. May He direct us to you, so that um, you know all this can happen. Okay. And then He prays uh, or declares over them. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Okay. So uh, you know. So this is something which is uh, central to the theme of uh, of the believer, you know, a theme of the believer or life of the believer, right? 
he also says that you know when you that your love for each other abounds and that is noticeable the way they they had love for one another and that's something that people noticed immediately and something that drew people or people glorified god and it was spoken of as a testimony right so something that um, paul is reiterating again now may the may the may the lord make you increase and abound in this love that you have okay may it uh, may it increase may it go beyond any limits right and he says and so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our god and father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints okay so um, let your life you no know, let let the love increase right may it cause your love to grow and abound so so that he may establish your hearts blameless See, so now this love for god and love for people is going to result in living a holy life because you know when you, when you have the love for god and you have the love for people you're not going to do anything against them right uh no work of flesh or you know like covetousness or or you know um or fornication or adultery or jealousy or malice gossip nothing of that sort um is going to you know even though there might be suggestions from the enemy or our own flesh but nothing of that sort is going to happen because you are already abounding in love you know your love has increased so much that you don't want to gossip your love for the fellow believer is so much that you don't envy you know you are or you know you're not envying them you're not jealous about them but rather you are encouraging and cheering them right and your love for the fellow believer is so much that you don't want to indulge in any kind of you know sin like fornication or adultery you don't want to cheat anyone right it's because your love for one another so what happens is that the lord is it has established you in holiness as well right so so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our god and father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all the saints so you know the second coming of the lord is very very clear uh, is established and is saying you know that that it's let it be let it be so you know the the reality of it the coming of the lord jesus christ with all his saints okay um so so this truth of the second coming uh, is something that uh, you know as much as the first coming of the lord is uh, established truth and even historically it is an established fact so also the second coming of the lord right you recall that uh, you know in acts chapter 1 you see that uh, you know when the lord is 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 uh, is resurrected and he's is ascending you know um uh from the mountain top and uh, he's already gone and uh, the the believers disciples are standing there and uh, and then they see these men in shining clothes and uh, uh they they ask them you know what are you what are you doing looking up and they say that the lord is you know the lord is taken up and they say yes in the same manner in which you saw him go he will come also okay talking about the second coming of the lord so which is a reality which is uh, the the truth and so we also must be strong in that truth that there the lord is coming again now that will result in you know in in the in, in a different perspective of how we live our earthly life how we live our life on earth because we know that the lord is coming again now it could be during our time as we live here or it could be you know after our time but the time that we live here you know will we will conduct our lives in in such a manner that we know that the lord is you know returning the lord is coming again coming soon right so uh, let's look at chapter 4 okay um right Uh, finally then brethren we urge and exhort in the lord jesus 
that you should abound more and more just uh, 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 more and more in the Lord Jesus. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we urge and uh, exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all, all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Okay, so in the, in the previous chapter, the last few verses, Paul talks about how you should abound in love. And, and he's saying, you know, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. And may he establish you in holiness. Right? Um, may he establish your hearts blameless in holiness because you know before our coming before the coming of our God Father and the Lord Jesus and all the company of angels so a uh, company of uh, with all his saints so um, so he's saying okay this is what it is so he's talking about the holiness aspect of the believer so he's saying we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus okay, so about how we need to live or how we need to walk so walking, you know, how it requires life and growth and uh, you know, it's something that attracts the atten attention of people and walking, you know, walking towards a certain goal. So our walk, the way we live our life needs to be in such a manner you know, that we need to. So they, they were actually instructed how he says, just as you have received, how you ought to walk and to please God. So is our life pleasing God? No, that's a question. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple question, but very profound one. Um, is what I'm doing pleasing God? Right? So we're not judging everything by the results. Right? You might say, okay, I'm doing this, this, this. I'm sharing the gospel. People are getting saved. I'm ministering the word. People are being blessed. Or I'm you know, leading in worship. And you know, people are experiencing the presence and power of God and all that. Um, well, all that is good. You know, so it's good to ask, you know, am I pleasing God? Right? Uh, am I pleasing God? In, in my personal life, am I pleasing Him? Very important question. So he's saying, you know, that how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. You know, for you to be living a sanctified life, it is. This is the will of God. Okay, so uh, primarily, you know, if you, if, you know, there's no two doubt, there's no two ways about it, right? Is God interested in my sanctification? Is God interested in me living a pure life, a holy life? Of course, this is the will of God. Okay, so uh, he, you know, uses the word. Thelema, which means this is God's desire, this is God's uh, inclination, this is God's pleasure. What is it? That you live a consecrated, set apart uh, life with regard to your, you know, um, that you, with regard to uh, your, your, your living a moral life, and she says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Okay, so so it's talking to the believer who might be tempted to consider to live an immoral life. Right, it's talking to the believer. It's talking to the church. He's saying you should abstain, which means that probably. There were some who had, who were being tempted, who were giving in to temptation, and living a life that was not holy, right? Apart from what, how the Lord would want them to live. So He's saying, you 
should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel, that, that is, means that your own selves, your, your bodies, in sanctification and honor and not in passion of lust like the Gentiles do. So you're, you know, you're looking outside, you're looking at society, you're looking at what's happening around in the world, and it's very different, but you are called to be different. Okay, many times you see others and say, this is how the world is living. So why can't I as a believer do that? You know, why can't I as a believer live the same way? You know, this is how they, you know, one, uh, you know, lives their life. This is how they spend their leisure time. This is how they, this is how, these are the things that they watch. These are the things that they listen to. This is the kind of entertainment they have. Things Paul saying, you know, you know, God's pleasure and God's desire is that you live a sanctified life. You know, you, so it, it's almost like saying that you bring delight to God's heart. You bring, bring pleasure to God's heart when you live a sanctified life. Okay, so that, you know, that is how, it, that's just how it is. Right? So saying that, um, no, not in passion of lust like Gentiles, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. So saying, you know, you, this is God's will for you. This is something that brings pleasure that, that you know to God. So it's his pleasure. It's his delight. Right? And um, he's saying that uh, you obtain from sexual immorality. He just, you know, spells it out, sexual immorality, whatever would come under that category of sexual immorality, you avoid it. Okay. And he says, you should know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay. And not like uh, uh, what the Gentiles would do. Okay. So in, in verse 6, he said that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother. So the word defraud, it means to, um, you know, to, to take an advantage of, unfair advantage. Um, it's like overreaching, right? Taking advantage, an unfair advantage of another person. So I don't want any of you to do that, right? And uh, what could, whatever could be the situation which under which that one might defraud their brother, Okay, so in this area of sexual immorality, so he's talking about, you know, another believer, um, you know, you're taking advantage of another believer in this area. So you should not do that because the Lord is the avenger of all such. Okay, so what does that mean? That the Lord is the avenger, that he takes revenge. Right? So it's very clear, the Lord is the avenger. So if you're going to be you know, defrauding, if you're going to take advantage of other people, other believers in this whole area uh, of sexual immorality, beware because the Lord is the avenger. You know, you might think, okay, I'm a believer, I'm, you know, uh, I can get away. No, the Lord is the avenger. There will be consequences. You know, the Lord notices all this. So uh, he says, for God. Now, you know, as we also forewarned you and testified. So look at all these things that Paul has been teaching uh, the believers, the church in Thessalonica. You know, we, what, what a, you know, that you, they should, uh, about afflictions, about tribulations. You know, these are not things that we normally would, uh, you know, teach uh, a new believer. But he has been teaching. Hey, there will be tough times. Hey, there will be difficult times. There will be times that will test your faith but you need to stand strong. Afflictions, tribulations. Again, about holding yourself accountable, you know, uh, that you live a life of sanctification. This brings God pleasure. This is the will of God. He taught them that. He is also forewarned well, how, you know, don't take advantage of other people. You know, don't try to just, you know, your selfish, fleshly needs, you know, do not take advantage of other people. And defraud, don't take unfair advantage uh, over others in this matter. For the Lord is the avenger, and we have forewarned you. It's something that he's taught them. 
he's warned them. Uh, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. So therefore he rejects us, does not, does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So it's very clear that you know God. this is what God has called us. He has called us to um, uh, holiness, not uncleanness. So if you're rejecting this for whatever reason, rejecting this teaching, rejecting this truth, um, know that you are actually rejecting the word of God. Right? It's you're not. It's not rejecting the word of man. It's not because, in other words, he's saying, this is not my opinion that you should reject it, but it's actually God's standards and God's words. So, if you're rejecting this, you are actually rejecting God and not man. You're not rejecting the word of man, but you're rejecting the word of God. And who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And why does he say that? Because they are speaking by the Spirit of God. Right? They are ministering by the Spirit of God. And they are bringing this truth by the Spirit of God. So he's saying, you know, you're rejecting God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He has given us his Spirit and we are ministering. We are speaking by the Spirit of God. And so you are rejecting uh, God. Okay. Verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Some, some, some very practical instruction here. So he's saying that, you know, you, I don't have any uh, anything more to say or write to you about concerning love for one another, you know, loving one another, loving each other. Um, uh, so I don't have anything more to write because you are taught by God to, about this. You, know, you are directly taught uh, by God about this. You know this. And, you, and so you also do. You know, it's something that you live out practically daily in your life. So we see that. And um, not only to all the brethren, but also to those who are in Macedonia, um, like whoever may be visiting, whoever you are visiting, you know, you show this love in very practical um, ways. So it's evident. Right? It's clear. But he's saying, he's, I, we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Um, so he's saying that, um, you know, you, why don't you increase more in this there is always more you know the, the fact is that whatever attributes of god that you see it, it comes from a place of infiniteness right because god is uh, is is big he's infinite so when we talk about patience when we talk about love when we talk about forgiveness it comes from that place you know, god is god being the source of it you know, especially when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, of love and joy and peace and so on. Um, Galatians 5 talks about that. We see that it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Right? So the Holy Spirit is the one who is Holy Spirit, who's God, who's infinite, who's making all these things happen, who's bringing these characteristics. So there's always more because he comes. It is infinite. It's without limits. It does not run out. So he's saying, I urge you that you increase more and more. What are the other practical instructions? You live a quiet life. You know, to you know, you mind your own business. You know, don't don't be like like a busybody um, um, that interfering in other other people's lives. Um, you know, the word quiet life meaning a restful life. Like, so he's saying, quiet life, you uh, mind your own business. Don't be, you know, unnecessarily be uh, poking your nose into other people's things. You, know? uh, you work with your hands and so that you, you will have something. Uh, you work with your hands, meaning that you know, so that you may lack nothing. Right? So which means that God is not against us. You know, when there are needs to be taken care of, um, God is really not against us working in that way, right? Us working, and uh, you know, uh, if sometimes we think, right? Oh, I, I should not work. Um, 
well, God will provide. Well, it's true, God provides, but God provides through the through the work as well, right? So, so he's saying you may walk properly towards those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. No, there's no lack. So this, you know, when you when you do this, when you don't, you know, when you don't interfere in other people's lives unnecessarily. And you're working with your own hands, and you're minding your own business, and you're, you know, living a quiet life. Um, so this will enable you to walk properly, in a right manner, towards those who are outside. Now, those, those who are, when when he's saying outside, he's saying those who are, um, you know, of the world. That we may walk properly, and the word used there is decently, and orderly, um, and honestly. Right, towards those who are uh, outside, towards those, those who are outside of your faith, outside, you know, uh, not part of the church, and, and so on. So they, you know, you're you're, work, you're living, a, you know, a decent life. Okay, so and that you may lack nothing. Okay, and verse thirteen to eighteen. Okay, so here uh, Paul talks about another important aspect about. Uh, uh, about the Lord's coming again, and about those who die. Okay, so before the coming, second coming of the Lord, what happens to those who die? Okay, what happens to those who pass away? Uh, so he is uh, writing about that. He is establishing something about that. So he's saying, you know, uh, um, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this, way, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, the thing is, the truth, not only does it edify, not only does it liberate, but truth is also comforting. Truth can make us uncomfortable, especially if you are not in the truth. But tr truth can bring a lot of comfort and reassurance to those who need it. Okay, so this is the truth about those who have fallen asleep in Christ, who have passed away. And so he's saying, "I do not want you to be ignorant." No, you 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 see that this is the same thing that he uses in one Corinthians also. He says uh, one Corinthians twelve, "I do not now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. Right? I don't want you to be without knowledge." So it's 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 say it's you know in other words he's saying you know you you cannot live ignorantly uh, you cannot say that um, oh I don't know uh, I don't know yet you know he's saying okay the scripture teaches right? God illuminates the Holy Spirit brings about illumination so uh, so this lack of knowledge or information uh, about this you know I I don't want you to be without this information, right? I don't want you to be lacking in this information or lacking in this truth. What is it? Concerning those who have fallen asleep. No. Lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Now, yes, it is true that people are dying, believers who put their faith in the Lord Jesus, maybe family members, maybe friends, and uh, you know they have gone on to be with the Lord. But I, he's saying that I don't want you to sorrow. Right? Sorrow is, uh, uh, yes, it's something that, that is natural. Like you miss them, people who have passed away, 
you know we miss them in our uh, in our daily lives uh, we miss their presence we miss their conversations we miss what they you know who they were suddenly there is absence right so he's saying yes there there is definitely uh, you know sorrow okay sadness no but he's saying i don't want you to sorrow as those who do not have hope so it means there is a place for us to sorrow be sorrowful and uh, grieve over people who have passed away yes you do you know this crying and this sorrow and sadness etc but it is different from from those who sorrow without hope okay when the those who sorrow without hope without any expectation without any faith and hope you know that sorrow is different because that's a sorrow which is uh, which is which has no end that's a sorrow which is which does not have hope and expectation you know that's a sorrow which is like which is like a prison you know, there's no there's no way out there is no you know there is no uh, there's no hope at all but then he's saying you know you sorrow as those with hope how for if we believe that jesus died and rose again okay you believe in jesus you believe in the resurrection we believe that that's how we have new life right if we believe that jesus died and rose again you know as as much as you know that is something that all of them believe in right as believers um, they have actually turned from the idols to put their trust in the living god so they have trusted in god they've experienced the power of the gospel right in their own lives and like we see in every church like uh, where paul planted and paul would have taught them about the gifts paul would have taught them about the you know prayed over them about the baptism of the holy spirit and the gifts of the spirit like praying in tongues and prophecy and all those he would have taught them and they would have experienced the power of god right so there's no doubt in their minds about you know the gospel they would have you know seen the transformation in their own lives right so he's saying for if we believe that jesus died and rose again this as as sure as that truth is that you believe in even so god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus so he's talking about the resurrection he's talking about the resurrection of those who sleep in jesus and uh, you know the the fact that they will be brought by god for this we say to you by the word of the lord so here is a revelation from the holy spirit and it's the word of the lord right uh, this is the word of the lord what is it that we who are alive and re- remain until the coming of the lord will by no means precede those who are asleep okay which means that when we remain you know there is something happening together there's nothing you know we we will not go ahead or we will not be with the lord ahead of those who are you know uh, we will by, by no means precede them, them who are asleep for the lord will descend from heaven with a shout so this verse 16 he talks about what is happening at the coming of the lord the lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel you know there is the proclamation there's the voice of the archangel and there is the trumpet of god okay which is again talk trumpet of god speaking about proclamation you know uh, it's something uh, it's a, it's a, the, the trumpet uh, alerting something uh, of an event okay so the trumpet was sounded for battle the trumpet was sounded for before an uh, an a royal announcement was made right so here is it here's a trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first so those who are dead in christ now that's important who are the dead in christ those who have died believing in the lord jesus or those who have died experiencing salvation right these are the ones who are saved these are the ones who are born again and they have died okay so they, they will rise first then we who are alive and the people who are still alive who are remaining will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the lord therefore comfort one another with these words he's saying you know 
So since this is the truth, as much as salvation, what you experience is the truth, you comfort one another. You share this with one another. And sorrow, you know, be sorrowful when or grieve with hope. Okay. So grieve with hope, with this expectation that we will be reunited with the ones who have fallen asleep in Christ. Okay. So that's the difference. So he's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. Do not grieve as those with no hope. So this is also something that he's taught the church. Right? And uh, we get an opportunity to serve, I mean, to teach, you know, maybe at funerals and so on. But this is something that the, every believer should know. Right? He's saying, I don't want you to be not knowing this truth. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, look at chapter five. I think we have a few more minutes. So. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. <coughs> Excuse me. But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are off the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So he's talking about times and seasons, the second coming of the Lord. And he says, yeah, it's going to come suddenly, abruptly, and uh, like a thief in the night. But, you know, you, you will not be, but you don't have to be taken by surprise. Or this day need not overtake you. Because... You are not in darkness, but you are in the day. And he contrasts between those who live in darkness, those who live uh, uh, in the day. You know, so he's saying, you know, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch, be watchful, and be sober. Okay, those who are, uh, you know, those who are, those who sleep sleep at night, and those who uh, get drunk are drunk at night. So he's talking about the lifestyle of those who are in darkness, you know, in, in ignorance. So this is what they do. They are in darkness and they do that you know they are not expecting you know, they're not watching um, they are not sober their lifestyle reflects that but you are of the day so be sober put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation okay so let this be your lifestyle you be sober you put on the breastplate of faith and love for God did not appoint us to wrath. Now, as believers, know that you are of the day. Know that you are of the light. Now, you are not appointed. You know, you're not set in place for the wrath. And what else? What are you appointed for? But to, you are appointed to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might say, okay, have I not already obtained salvation? Yes, of course. But the salvation is complete in the day of the Lord. Right? Who died for us that whether we should wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Okay? So, whether you're alive, whether you're dead, and now, you know, we should live for him or live with him. Now, that's the um, that's what God's desire is. Okay, therefore, comfort one another. Again, he says, you know, use this to comfort one another. And more than comfort, build up one another, just as you are also doing. Okay, so um, so this is what uh, he says uh, about, so he's talking about the second coming, and he's talking about uh, how it would be, how the day would be. And it need not caught catch you unawares because you live as people in the day, not doing something that people in darkness would do. Right? You'll be sober, you'll be expectant, you'll be watchful, and let your life be one of uh, as those who live in the day. Right? And uh, so th 
God has not appointed you for wrath. No, he's not appointed you for condemnation. Know that. But it is for salvation. Your salvation will be complete in Christ. You know, your redeemed, glorified bodies and uh, salvation is going to be complete. So you've been appointed for that and not for condemnation. Right? So for the believers who are living, you know, that's again comfort. So he's saying comfort. And not just comfort, but there's built, we are built up, right? Edify one another, just as you are also doing. Okay, so we'll continue from verse 12 in the next class. Um, and then we will also study uh, Second Thessalonians, which has like three more chapters. And with that, we'll come to the end of uh, our, our course, right? So next class, we will finish this course. Okay, right. Thank you. God bless. Uh, we'll meet again next class. Thank you, Pastor. Bye-bye. God bless.